Good evening. I'm Lindsay Kirkpatrick, and I'm the pastor of Asbury United Methodist Church. I'm so honored to get to worship with you tonight for a Good Friday service. Good Friday is the day on which Jesus gave himself up for us on the cross. And so tonight, we look forward to being able to journey together through the events of Jesus' last day as he went to the cross. Tonight, you will hear the various scriptures read, and while those scriptures are being read, you will also see a piece of artwork that illustrates and corresponds with that passage that's being read. After that, we will take a journey to various church members' homes where they will share with us their own personal reflection on that particular passage of scripture as we walk passage by passage, scripture by scripture, through those final events for Jesus. You know, Good Friday is kind of a difficult worship service to celebrate it doesn't feel like something we celebrate, right? And sometimes I think we want to just skip on right ahead to Easter. Um, and yet I think it's important to take a moment, at least once a year on Good Friday, to remember and reflect on just how deep and wide the love and grace of Jesus Christ is for each one of us. So welcome to worship tonight. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Oh, hi, welcome to my garden. I'm out here in the garden this morning and uh, you see I have some, there's some beautiful white amaryllis blooming and I'm planting some spring flowers, some dianthus and verbena. And it's a wonderful place to come and connect with nature and with God. And you can nurture plants by watering and fertilizing. We're just, let me just plant this down here real quick. And you want to make sure to keep the weeds out. It's important you don't let the weeds take over. But I just love to come out to the garden and work and uh, connect with God. You can pray and meditate. And you know, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray and connect with God as he was deeply grieved and distressed and to Jesus I believe the garden meant a place of peace and solitude a place away from the hustle and bustle and the crowds and as he prayed that night he showed his humanness to us in that he asked God if possible to take this cup from him but he also knew that it was not his will it was God's will and then Jesus told his disciples, watch and pray. And I think that's a very important instruction for us. Jesus was in the garden praying uh, to God and 
pouring his heart out just prior to the crucifixion and he found the disciples had fallen asleep three times but you know I've fallen asleep more than three times when I should be watching and praying and you know Jesus prayed and he was the one without sin so if he without sin felt the need to pray then I know that for myself a sinner I surely need to pray now just imagine the vision of the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus praying I just get a real sense of his love for me and for you and for what he went through that week for me and and then he died on the cross for me and he died on the cross for you that is truly amazing love thank you Jesus and now would you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for coming by today. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. While Jesus was in the garden and speaking to his disciples, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. When I think about Judas, the first word I think of is betrayal. There's no doubt that he betrayed Christ, but I'm not sure why. I'm not sure what his motivation is. I'm not sure if anyone really knows, but we do know that the consequences for that decision are something that could never be changed. And even though he regretted it later, he couldn't go back and change those events. I'm not sure if he betrayed Christ and for the reasons that it ended up being, or if it was something more selfish, that he was going to get the money. That's certainly a simple uh, way to look at it. But maybe he wanted that money to help the poor or to help with the mission that the group was going through and thinking that there was a different direction that the ministry of Christ could, could uh, take advantage of um, by using those funds. I don't know. I don't know if anyone does. But we do know that those decisions and that, that Judas made caused Christ's death and caused harm to the entire group uh, for all history. So I'm not sure what Judas had in mind when he made that decision, but we do know the consequences that were there. And I think we all have times when we have to make decisions and Sometimes we make them with a great intent and they don't work out and there's still consequences that we have to have to do and to live with uh, when we make those decisions. So when I think of Judas, um, I'm not quite sure whether to feel sorry for him or not um, because I think perhaps he was well-intended and it didn't work out the way he thought or perhaps it was more sinister and it was just pure greed and selfishness on his part. I don't think we'll ever know. But I do think when we try to make decisions and 
and work with other people that we need to be mindful that our decisions impact others and that there are consequences for our actions and that the motivation for decisions make a difference and it will impact what we're doing. So when we're trying to truly help others, I think it will help us. And if we're looking at either through selfishness or greed or for power or whatever type of manipulation we're trying to do, it can misguide us and take us in the wrong direction, just like it did Judas. Join me in these words. Your words will be in the bold. With hesitant compassion, with conditional love, with disobedience, and with trust and love misplaced in other things, we know we have all betrayed you, Lord. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out in the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. We've all heard this story before but something still impact us as we read it today. Peter denies knowing Jesus even after spending months or years following him and after promising to follow him to the point of death just hours before. It seems a huge betrayal to us now, but how often have all of us shied away from acknowledging Jesus, especially when under threat? How many of us deny knowing him by what we do or what we fail to do? How many of us not deny knowing him, but decide not to get to know him better? In the moments following the arrest, Peter was afraid, but immediately remorseful once, as Jesus had said, the rooster crowed. The Gospel of Luke says that at that moment, Jesus turned and looked at Peter directly. Peter might have thought in a moment of fear that he had discarded all of his investment in relationship with Jesus. But Jesus knew Peter and knew it would happen and loved Peter anyway. In the days before his arrest, Jesus reserved his harshest condemnations, not for those who sinned, but for those who justified themselves the Pharisees and leaders who believed they didn't need Jesus to be justified. They didn't need him to join God forever. Um, their actions were enough by themselves. Although I'm sure Peter didn't feel it at the moment, Jesus knew all about Peter's weakness and loved him anyway. I think all of us can recall at those moments when we are most remorseful and filled with brokenness, that those moments of remorse and brokenness bring us closest to God. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, thank you for your love for us and for your sacrifice for us. Thank you for knowing us and for forgiving us when we deny you. Lord, you know that I don't come close to meeting the standards in your word for being a teacher or a leader, but I thank you that you have given us a spirit of a teacher, the best teacher, your Holy Spirit, to be with us at all times, even if we feel afraid or even if we deny you, your spirit shows us that we are never alone. I pray that you would use that spirit today and throughout the rest of the year and all of us to teach us and heal us 
and help us to better serve your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Matthew 27, 11 through 26. For me, one of the most frustrating stories in the Bible. Of course, now we know why it had to happen the way it did, but still, looking back at it, you have to be upset with Pilate. He had all the power in the world to release Jesus. I mean, clearly, they brought this guy in. He was no king in his eyes. He had no wealth, no power, no soldiers. He wasn't trying to lead a revolt against the Romans. All those factors would play into the fact that he was innocent of what they were claiming. In fact, his innocence was just solidified in Pilate's eyes when his wife came to him and said, don't have anything to do with this guy, he's innocent. But when Pilate saw that he was not getting anywhere with the crowd, they were just dead set on having this guy executed. He took some water, washed his hands of it, and said, the blood is on your hands. He even tried to reason with them, tried to give them an out by giving them parables. Still, they wanted Jesus instead. That's why Pilate washed his hands. The Romans desired two things in the provinces, tribute and peace. A successful governor was one who kept everything quiet and popular tumult was greatly disliked as being troublesome and expensive if not dangerous. He didn't want persecution against him or the Romans, which is easy to see why. Persecution against Christians often leads to bad things. One such instance was with a girl named Cassie Renee Bernal. She was a Columbine victim. When asked about if she believed in God, she said yes and was murdered for it. As it says in Matthew 5 verses 10 through 12, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Perhaps that's why Jesus said, Forgive them, for they know not what they do.
join with me in these words. Your words will be in bold. Pilate didn't want to be one against many. We too have opted out of standing up for Christ when it was against the current. Forgive us for the times we have washed our hands of you, even for a moment, Lord. Join with me in these words. Your words will be in bold. Pilate didn't want to be one against many. We too have opted out of standing up for Christ when it was against the current. Forgive us for the times we have washed our hands of you, even for a moment, Lord. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Those of you that know me love, know I love to build things. And I'm no carpenter by a long shot. But I do take a lot of pride and enjoyment in being able to build things that my family and friends can come enjoy with me. But you know, I am a sinner. I'm not proud of it. We all are sinners. In fact, it's our sins that led Jesus to the cross. So it's been speculated that the crucifixion crosses were built ahead of time and just kept for when they need them. It's also speculated that they were probably built maybe by local carpenters carpenters that took pride in their work as they worked through the city but were used to build these crosses. If you think about the nails that were used, you know they had to be big nails to be able to go into the, the size of the lumber. And to push this kind of a nail into a board, it has to be a heavy hammer. They didn't use small tools. So that's just give you some thought of how things may have been at that time. As you can see, 
I missed a few times, just as it probably happened at that time. Probably didn't care. Those doing the, the crucifixion probably did not care. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.